Hey guys, Ken here. I wanted to do the next lecture on emphasis and focal points. The lecture will consist of slides basically talking about the different types of dominance and emphasis. Now focal point is more of a description of what emphasis is. Emphasis is putting making something more important than another, so what something else is. And through emphasis, our eyes go to that object. And, and typically, that's what we consider to be the focal point, is what our eyes go to. So focal point isn't necessarily dominance. It's a result of dominance or emphasis. So emphasis and focal point. There are several that I'm going to be talking about during this lecture. I've listed them here. Isolation, convergence, contrast, anomaly, size, and framing. Now there was a lecture earlier where I talked about that the, the nomenclature or the name that we give certain things can be modified a little bit depending on who's giving the lecture. For example, if you were to go online and look for emphasis, you might find more information, or the same information as what you see up here, but it might be called, instead of size, it'll be called scale. Contrast might be, you know, uh, they may call it something other than, than contrast. Convergence, they may do lines. Anyway, the, those are, these are the, the basics of what, what focal point and emphasis and dominance is about. Again, like most lectures, I'm going to start by reading what it is that you're going to be working towards. Emphasis is created by visually reinforcing something we want the viewer to pay attention to. Focal points are areas of interest the viewer eyes skip to. So, I mean, if we break this down, again, it's it's the emphasis, we put the emphasis on an object, and the focal point is what the viewer looks at, which is the, the, where the emphasis is placed. The strongest focal point with the greatest visual weight is the dominant element of the work. Elements of secondary importance could be termed subdominant, and elements with the least visual weight subordinate. Isolation, leading lines, convergence, contrast, anomaly, size, placement, and framing, focus and depth of field, and absence of focal points are some of the strategies used to help create these degrees of importance. So the reason why I wanted to put this in is because it's, this is from a different source than I was using for the actual lecture. And because of that, it's, going to, it, it's more encompassing. It gives a little bit more about the absence of focal points. If we don't have a focal point, that can be considered confusing to some people. Depth of field and focus, not really for us, but it's for photography. Size, placements. When we talk about, we'll talk about these during the, the lecture. Okay, artistic importance. Well, emphasis gives prominence to part of the design. Artists use the design principle of emphasis and focal point to focus the viewer's attention on one or more parts of a composition by accentuating certain shapes, intensifying value or color, featuring directional lines, or strategically placing the objects and images. Makes sense, right? Where you place it, the color of the object, the size of the object, all of these things come into play when somebody looks at your, your piece. If you have everything the same size there's, and everything's the same color, you start to run into this problem of not really having a focal point. And uh, a way to kind of go back to another lecture, if we were talking about unity, without a focal point, maybe it's too unified. Unity is really strong. The variety would you give you a a dominance of whatever's different. And again, we'll get into the slides in a little bit. So isolation. 
Now this is a theory of Gestalt, and I don't know if you remember me talking, I wanted to do a, a lecture on Gestalt, but I'm hoping that this will kind of fill in those blanks. Or uh, not fill in the blanks, but, but more or less cover Gestalt without having to do a lecture on Gestalt. So isolation. By separating the subject from other distracting elements and placing it against a plain background, the viewer is left with nothing else to focus on. In drawing and painting, etc., etc., this means not adding anything that does not add to or emphasize the subject or purpose. Photographers need to pay a special attention to what is in the background of the picture and work to eliminate an unwanted clutter. This can be done by changing the viewpoint of the photo that's taken from and masking or removing things from view. Now here are three examples of using isolation. What I want you to get about isolation is that in Gestalt, when we talk about the way the humans look at certain things, actually the way we look at everything, our mind wants to make sense of what it is that we're looking at. And when we talk about isolation, we look for groups. And what happens is, is our mind tries to figure out what's going on. We look at these two things, and I've talked to some students individually about this. I don't think I've talked about it to the whole class, but our eyes will look at this as one group and this as a group as well. Now, if we look at this and we try to define what is the most important element, because there's only um, one element here and multiple here, we tend to think, that this is the most important object. It's just the way humans look at things. And when I say humans, I'm talking about probably 95 to 99% of us will see that this is more important than this. Now we can go through this, each one of these images and do the same thing. If I were to look at these jugs, why is this one by itself? Why is it surrounded by negative space and what makes it so important that it's not part of this group. Well, we don't really know, but we do know that it is. For some reason, this is more important than these. We have, I don't know how many here, probably about 15, 12, 15, and they're all together. This one's all by itself. So there's something special about that, and our mind wants to understand why it is that it's separate. Again, same thing up this, this top image. When we look at that, the crows, most of the crows are on the, the top wire. But there's only one crow or bird on the bottom wire. Why? Our mind sees this and kind of, all right, so what's going on here? We don't know the answer, but the, the average person is going to catch that this is different from those. And through isolation, through separating one thing from the other, the others, I should say, we have made the one item more important. So the dominant item in all three of these images is that individual element. It doesn't matter if it's a bird, if it's a circle, or it's a jug. It doesn't matter. It's by itself, which makes it more important than the rest of the items in the composition. Convergence. Now convergence generally means things coming together. And uh, I've got a couple samples in here. Hopefully it will make sense as, as I go through it. But a line, arrow, or similar triangular or elongated element can indicate a direction and point towards something. So like an arrow pointing towards something, Remember we talked about uh, implied line? If I were to point like this, most people will mentally see a line that comes from our finger and will follow it until it stops at something that we think the person is pointing at, in this case me. When multiple elements converge towards a point, such as lines going back into perspective, they can create an even greater pull of attention in that direction. So multiple lines, say I do this, 
Now I realize you can't see down, but typically as humans, we're going to say, okay, well, there's something when these, when those angles come together, that's what's important. Now I've got uh, two images here. The first one is pretty simple. This is a, a basic explanation of what convergence is. All of these implied lines are pointing towards the center. And even the circular dots, which is like a dotted line, go that direction as well. Now typically, the average human will know that this is the center. This is what's important because our eyes are following it. Now, once you have a couple seconds to look at it, you might look at other items. You might, your eyes might wander, say, up. The, the circular dotted line, trying to figure out why that's different. But in general, when we first look, everything kind of points to this. Now, the second example is Da Vinci's uh, Last Supper. Now, I use this because this is kind of a great example of how to focus what it is that you want to be important without being, you know, in somebody's face. This is obvious. This comes across as being simplified. It's like we've got lines all going down towards one object, and that object is is big and it's in the center or almost in the center and there's no mystery there's nothing right well here da vinci shows something that is very very clever i wouldn't say clever it's it's part of just being good a good artist and what he did is by using perspective if we come over here we can see that these lines, like the line, now remember how this is up, this dashed, these, these items are like a line, and we have a line that comes along here. We have a line that comes along here, we have a line that comes along here, and we have lines that come down the bottom at the top. Now you can see that representation here, taking the image out of it, and we can see that that one point, that center point, where all those lines kind of come together happen to be Jesus. Okay? So what da Vinci did is not being obvious, and this is kind of the way you should work. You, it, this, is, this is like too simplified. It's a good example of it, but it's simplified. This is subtle, and you can control the viewer on what they look at. You can control your image to make it the strongest possible by, by focusing on or pointing towards what you consider to be the most important. And it's all done subliminally. We don't, they're not telling us what's the most important. He's kind of, uh, Da Vinci's kind of forcing us into knowing what's important. So another way of uh, dominance is contrast, and contrast is created when two or more forces operate in opposition. Honestly, there's a lot of, of things that work with contrast. Anything, it's like the yin and yang. It's the opposites. These are some of the big ones, though. Static and dynamic, large and small, solid and textured, curvilinear and rectilinear. Those are kind of just the basics, and they um, movement, uh, scale, color, and uh, shape. So these these things can be broken down in such a way as to show contrast and dominance. Okay, so I've got some samples up here that are contrasting elements. First of all, we have kind of a plain field, and then we have two things that are contrasting each other based on size. They become what's important in this. Now, this, 
I'm not sure, actually while I'm doing this lecture, I'm kind of questioning whether or not I should have put this image in the presentation. The reason why is because this is more based on scale. I mean, it is a contrast of size. This is large, this is small. But further on when I talk about size and scale, this might be a better image. But think about the contrast between these two. The dominance is based on the, the contrast of size. Here, the dominance is, is placed on color. All the shapes are the same. The only thing that's different is the color. And our mind thinks that this is more important. Here, because the, the butterfly has a certain shape, our mind looks at that and understands that that's what this is about. In, this exam in, in these examples, you can see that it is nearly impossible not to focus on the contrasting item. The following examples show contrast in color, shape, and scale. Now, you've already seen these for a little while, but when you first looked, what was it that you focused on? My guess is you focused on the big ball, the red umbrella, and the butterfly. And those are the reasons that humans see things a certain way is because of the contrast. Big, color, and shape. Anomaly. Well, anomaly is something that's different. And it's not contrast, because contrast is like, like the opposite. Um, anomaly is something that's different. A single square in a repeating pattern of circles will stand out. It's not like everything else. It doesn't blend in. It breaks the pattern. This can call attention and add interest. In something perfectly flat, smooth, white, etc., our eye will always be drawn to the one little flaw, the pencil scratch, the rough spot, the wrinkle. Anomaly can also be created by just things that are not normally seen together or depicting scenes that invert or alter the everyday. Again, as um, a graphic design professor, I can look at somebody's work and I can see the things that aren't right. It's just out of seeing things enough, eventually I get to that point where I can notice the inconsistencies in their design. And that's, as humans, that's normal. We can look at a building and we can see that there's a broken window. You have 10 windows and there's just one broken window it stands out because that's what's different. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense to me. All right, now here's some examples of anomalies. The very top one is right out of that description. We have this, this area. Our whole composition is nothing but squares, except for the one object. And that CB, that, that blue circle, stands out as being unique. We will focus on that. We don't really have a choice. That's, as humans, this is what we're going to look at. Everything else we understand, we don't need to see any more of it. We need to see what's different. Down here, not quite as strong of an anomaly, but if we look around, we see these mannequins. What's the only thing? I mean, color's the same, the hue, this, the, the whole feeling of, of this whole photograph is the same, except for one item, and that's this woman. We are going to focus on her because it's just part of who, uh, the human nature. It's what's different is what, what we're drawn to. At the top up here, same basic thing. We have four images. Now, if I were to ask you which images are more important, what would you say? Now remember, there's four images. My guess that 80 to 90, maybe even more percentage of people would say these two are more important. And the reason for that is if the, what's the difference between these is that this has a box around it. What makes it different? This box. Makes it more important as well. Down here, we have two squares and 
a geometric form in the center. A geometric form is different, so it's what stands out as being unique, being special, deserving our attention. Now, I talked about this before with the two tennis balls, and um, basically, size or scale. Scale is the, is the size of elements in a painting compared to what they look like in real life. The artist manipulates proportion to emphasize the importance or unimportance of an object or area. Often the focal point is emphasized by making it larger in proportion to the rest of the elements on the screen. Size. You know, if, if we see a small child actually larger than a grown man, whether it's forced perspective or whatever is happening, it's painted, typically we're going to focus on the child because it's larger. Some examples of uh, proportion or scale. The first one, the apple, it's huge. It's big. It's so big that we, we're, I mean, this is what's dominant in, in this photo, and it's a large apple. It dwarfs the book, everything else around it, and our, our eyes will focus on it. Now, there's not a lot of contrasting elements. The only thing that makes it important is the size of it. If, for example, the artist or the photographer who did this were to make it normal size, say it was only this big, like this, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it would, it would possibly be a focal point, but it wouldn't have the dominance that this has. Because that's large, it makes it very important to us. Down here, we have the foreground, which is, is probably in scale, but because this woman is larger than the rest of the items, she becomes the center of attention, the dominant item in this piece of work. And in here we have a kind of a simplified, obviously, scale proportion of this uh, small chick is so huge that it becomes the dominant issue. We have a regular sized man, we assume he's regular sized, we have a regular sized tractor, but then there's this small chicken that is huge and most of us will focus on that chicken the chick framing all right so framing is a way of getting someone's attention by telling them what is important and when I say telling I mean don't don't kind of fool them you're actually doing a frame which focuses their attention on whatever it is that you want them to focus on. Emphasis framing is a per, uh, persuasion technique where focus is placed on those specific aspects of a solution that encourage certain interpretations of the meaningful context and discourage certain others. This way, the meaningful context in which the choice of the hand will be evaluated is influenced. Wow, that's a mouthful. This way, the meaningful context in which the choice at hand is evaluated and influenced. Better example is to look at, look at some examples. Here, we've got perfect examples of, of simple framing. Now, I don't want you to get bogged down by how simple these examples are. You could have multiple different items that create a frame. I could have a tree here, a road sign here, road sign here, and maybe the branches of the tree kind of come out here, and I'd have the exact same thing. I'd be framing, it just wouldn't be as simplified of having this shape that actually frames this bike rider. So the, the top one, is if, if you were to look at this, chances are you're gonna focus on that object, the person in that area that we're kind of being told what's important. This 
is what's important, according to the artist. It's not, it's not these, this repetition of the, the bricks. It's not the diagonals. The diagonals give it movement. It makes it interesting. But what's important is that character right there. And we know that it's important because it is isolated by the frame. Here, again, we have a frame. When we look, this tells us what's important. Now, you could argue that this is just as important as this, except there's no figure in the center. There's no figure here. There's none here, and there's none here. What this, what our eyes do is frames this character, or this person, or this object, or element, and tells us that this is what we should be looking at. And this is the dominant item on, in the composition. Now when we move over here, another simplified way of doing this is that we have a photograph taken through some glasses, or a glass, a side of a glass. And this tells us that what's in the center of this is what's important. Now this stuff on the outside we may look at, we may be interested in, but when we first look, this tells us what we should focus on. What I want you to get from this lecture is that we control what the viewer sees and, and what's important to them. We decide what that viewer is going to look at first. And we can't control if they look somewhere else after we establish a focal point or a dominant area. But once you start to control the viewer in advertising or television or anything, once you understand how to control the viewer, you can control the whole situation. For example, I can have an advertisement where the focal point is up at the top. And then I want them to read some text along the side. And then they can look at the image. I determine how they are going to look. Now you can't, it's not 100% accurate, but in general as an artist, you have that control of controlling the viewer's direction that they, they look, by controlling what they look at, what's the, the secondary important object. Once you understand how to do that, your work will become stronger. All right, um, thank you guys. That's it for now. That went a lot faster than I expected.